Hello everybody. Welcome to this webinar, which is going to describe how to use topography for fitting contact lenses to irregular corneas. This webinar today is going to mainly concentrate on the Medmon machine for several reasons. One, this as a surface measuring machine, it is the most useful to get measurements and maps for fitting contact lenses. Secondly, it is the most widely used machine in the world. So it's very popular, it's very easy to use, and it's easy to explain. I will briefly touch on the Pentacam, uh, which is a scanning topography machine. It measures by a completely different method, um, but the main driver of this webinar is to describe the Medmont machine and its software to give you better understanding of how to use maps. A little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Lynn White. I'm clinical director at Ultravision. Uh, I am an optometrist and I have for very many years had a specialist practice for fitting irregular cornea and I also design contact lenses. Okay, so let's have a look at what we're going to cover today. So I'm going to go straight to basics and understanding how maps work, what they're there for and how the machine constructs a map for the measurement it takes. I'll then look at particular map types, specifically axial versus tangential, as it's really important to understand the differences between these two types of maps and how to find how to use them on your machine. Then I'll go through the Medmont software, showing them the, how to capture images, the map types, differential maps and, sh and so on. Then move on to, uh, particularly for our product, the, uh, how to use the base curve calculator for Kerasov lenses and how to set up the map to be able to input the information into the calculator. It's all very simple, but it will only work if you've got the correct tangential map. And then I'll move on to a live demonstration of showing you how to use the software for the Medmont machine. Okay. So first of all, just let's look at what topography is all about. And corner topography is actually has its, its origins in normal map and land topography. What this is all about is taking um, color effects to represent um, 3D shapes in, a two, in two dimensions. So this is a map of the world and you've got different colors to give the impression of height and depth. So how to relate that to everyday life? The top map here, this is me sitting here in Leighton Buzzard, 40 miles north of London in the UK, on a map that you'd get uh, on Google. And it's just showing you the names of places, towns and cities with roads connecting them and the, the odd lake or river. So you've got an idea of distance between places, but no idea of the landmass. Below here is exactly the same map of the same location, but now colours have been assigned to different areas to simulate high ground and low ground. So here we have hills around Leighton Buzzard, but Leighton Buzzard itself is sitting in the, in the bottom of a river valley. And once you understand that red is high ground and blue is low, you can then visualise in your head what the landscape looks like. And this is exactly what topography does with corneal topography. So this is not a new concept, um, by the way. Th this instrument here is the Klein Keratoscope, which is over 100 years old now. And this was used um, in the past to examine the quality of tear film, because uh, these, these rings reflect off the, uh, off the tear film, not the cornea and also the shape of the eye. So what it does is it, you, you switch it on, these rings light up, they reflect onto the cornea and the spacing of the lines tell you how well this corner is shaped. They should be equally well shaped as this one is. If you have severe distortions, it may be because the tear film is, is drying out, but you will see that those, those distortions change as the, as the eye links. If you've got something like keratoconus, a lot of these lines will start to become close, thinner and closer together, indicating steeper curvature, 
and other areas may flatten out and become wider, showing flatter curvature. So that principle of examining the eye with rings has been around for well over 150 years. Now, what the Medmont does here, the Medmont head, is it, it takes this and makes it a little bit more sophisticated. It puts the rings inside a cone. So this better matches the, corneal, the hemispherical corneal shape of the eye. It, but it does exactly the same thing. It projects the light onto the cornea, it photographs the result. And from that, the software then measures the distance between all these rings and it converts it into height data. This is the raw data that is the basis for all the software of all surface topography machines. So what it does, it assumes that the center of the cornea is the highest point, and then it measures the drop off from that point all the way out to the edge. And that's the data it records. And you can export this as, as a, um, a spreadsheet with lots and lots of numbers. And that's the sheer height data. Now, from that, it will then extrapolate to create various maps, such as tangential or axial curvature, power maps, wavefront analysis, elevation, and so on, all from that simple height data. And just reiterating this again, um, I've taken here um, a, a 3D output from the Eagle's Eye topography machine. In the software in that machine, you can rotate this and see it from all angles. But I've just taken a, a 2D shot here. So this is representing a real eye. Um, it's 22 millimeters across, so you've got some sclera as well as the cornea. And as I said before, it takes that height drop there and converts the software converts that into corneal shape and in this case in tangential cornea uh, curvature from that the software will give you the simulated k readings and lots of other information as well now the important thing to notice about topography is this is only accurate over eight millimeters diameter so that means it's really only measuring from about there to there with any accuracy at all. Once you get beyond this point, it is starting to interpret the data. And it's, it's really um, use, uh, useful that you understand that because this and not think this is a real measurement because sometimes that can be misleading, especially with irregular corneas. Your own reliable data is in the central eight millimeters. Now, here's the brief bit about the Pentacam. <clears throat> this machine measures by a totally different me uh, method. It's measuring by OCT. It's taking slices through the eye. And in this particular case, you'll see it's taking 25 slices all the way around. The software then interprets this image to give you the surface of the eye. It's not a direct measurement of the surface, it's an interpretation of an image. This is why it's less accurate. Also, if it's only taking 25 or even 50 slices, it's not covering anywhere near as many data points as the surface topographer does. So what is the use of Pentacam, you may ask? Well, the beauty of Pentacam is it gives you the OCT, which is excellent for medical uh, purposes. It also measures the front and the back of the cornea, which will give you what's going on back there, which you can't do with the surface um, topography machine at all. But additionally, it gives you the corneal thickness, which again is absolutely essential for if you're monitoring keratoconus. Now, it's useful to look at here at the scale at the bottom, because if you see here, it's from, it looks like it's going eight to eight. And I said, oh, it covers eight, but at, um, uh, topography. But that is actually covering 16, sort of minus eight to plus eight. So really, the only accurate portion is being monitored between this minus four and plus four, which is about that much. The rest of this map is interpolated 
it's invented from the software. So again, Pentacam uh, software may look like it's going edge to edge, but it actually is not. And that's really important to understand because really if this was 16, you'd be way past the limbus here and you can't see any evidence of that. Okay, so to summarize this section, the surface maps are absolutely better for contact lens fitting because they're based on a surface map based on many data points. The important thing to remember though, this is based on reflection from tear film. If you have difficulty me uh, measuring with a uh, surface topography because of dry eye, put some uh, wetting drops in, lubricating drops in the eye, and then retake the topography and you'll get a better map. If you've got a really bad tear film, you'll get a really bad map. The scanning maps are absolutely better for diagnosis. There's no doubt about that. You've got front and back surfaces. You can see the lens if you want to. You get corneal thicknesses, um, but this gives you less data points and is far less useful for contact lens fitting. And there are many instruments around now that actually combine the two. They are scanning and you can also take a surface map and those will actually give you the best of both worlds. But if you are just doing contact lens fitting, you're not interested in um, all the medical side of it, then a surface topography machine is not only better, it's also a lot cheaper. Okay. So here I'm going to explain the difference between axial and tangential. And a lot of this is historical. Um, going back a hundred years when we had, we, we were the, the scientists were constructing um, the geometry of the eye and the laws of refraction in the eye and how, how to actually refract eyes. A lot of assumptions were made. It assumed that the eye was a construct of two spheres put together, which was rotationally symmetrical about <coughs> an axis. That is why this map is called axial. It also assumes that the radius of cornea, yeah. the curvature of the cornea at any point was referred back to this axis. Now, what that means in practice is that it assumes that the central point here is the highest point of the cornea. And again, I'm emphasizing his, uh, um, the historical aspect because that means uh, that this was constructed for normal eyes. It was assumed that a cornea would be entirely normal and would have the highest point at the center. But as you well know, with keratoconus, that point could be anywhere on here, the highest point. And in order to make sense of the height data coming back, the actual map tends to get very distorted because it keeps trying to reference this, axi this axis and that point. So what does a tangential map do? Well, it, it, this, this is a very uh, freed up version, if you like. The word tangential comes from the fact that you draw a tangent to any point on the cornea. When you've got that tangent, you draw a line perpendicular to it and you draw a circle at that point, which means that the radius changes depending where you are on the cornea. This map is also called instantaneous because it is instantaneously measuring the radius at any point. Now, what that tends to mean in practice is that centrally, the two maps tend to agree. But the further you go away from the central point, they disagree markedly, and especially for irregular corneas. So again, either now or at the end, if you don't understand tangential, please ask, because it is, um, a confusing com uh, idea, but basically it means that it is accurately measuring the radius of curvature at any point on the front of the eye. Now, what I'm showing you here is, is information taken from our modeling project. Um, 
uh, a few years ago, we, we spent two years modeling um, an eye with Liverpool University to accurately represent uh, the human eye in a computer model and how contact lenses fit on that. And we took direct height data, the, the original raw data from the, uh, the eye surface profiler to create these, these ocular shapes. And we could manipulate these in our own software um, to understand what was, what was happening. Now, one of the first things that we understand is that if you're looking into an instrument, the eyes naturally converge. So when you're measuring a map, you're not measuring the eye straight on, the eyes slightly turned in towards the nose. So this is the, so this is the shape of an eye uh, straight from the eye surface profiler when it's looking into an instrument. We take the axial curvature map and the tangential curvature map. Then through our own software, we actually level the eye so it's straight and then retake the maps. And as you can see, the axial map changes a lot. The tangential map hardly changes at all. So what's really important in this is tangential maps are not sensitive to tilt and rotation. And that means if your, uh, your eye is converging a lot or if the patient's got really poor vision and the eye is wandering around, you can still take a map that is accurate, whereas the axial interpretation of that tends to be really distorted. So again, here we've got um, uh, an axial map, the actual power map, and we have tangential power map of exactly the same eye. You'll see here it's exactly the same amount of astigmatism. Now this you'll all recognize um, from very many maps you take and is the classic way of seeing that somebody's got astigmatism. But if you stop to think about it, this implies that you've got a really odd shape on the front of the cornea. And in fact, if you look at the power map here and it looks the same in curvature, you tend to get a really irregular shape going across the front of the eye, but nobody's cornea is that shape. Mm. If you look at the tangential map, you see here the corneal shape is, is much more normal and you do not have that characteristic figure of eight. This actually more closely represents the actual shape of the eye. And what it's showing you, you have two different power meridians, but you don't have this extremely unnatural figure of eight. So what I would say to you for that uh, here, anyway, the axial maps have extreme extremely good use in showing a patient that they've got a problem because not much actually shows up on a, on a tangential map. But if you're trying to understand corneal shape or corneal power, then the tangential map wins out every time. Now, I mentioned earlier on that as, as you get more towards the periphery, the tangential map actually represents the eye better. Again, we have two maps that are identical, it's from the, as in the identical patient, the identical eye. This is an axial, this is a tangential. And you can, I've put on here actually three, five and seven millimeter rings, um, slightly displaced, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry to say, um, but to show, to give you an idea of where we are on the cornea. Now, with the axial map, again, you, because it's struggling to try and relate everything to the center point, it shows a, um, a markedly distorted cornea. It looks like it's very, very steep here because it's red and very, very blue here. Visually, it looks a very distorted cornea. When you look at the tangential map, this is far less apparent and it looks more normal. And in fact, you can see by this green area here, you've got roughly the same shape going all the way around. And in fact, if you look at the seven millimeter ring, the readings at the top are in about eight and a half and at the bottom are about ten and a half. If you look at the axial, the bottom reading radius curve is 7.2, 7.2 to 10.6. So 
the interesting question is which is the correct representation of the corner at this point because if on any map you'll find these readings will be exactly the same in the middle but out here they're totally different and um all I can say is having spent nearly 10 years looking at this and looking at corneas and trying to match um, the final fit of a contact lens, a soft contact lens to an action map. After five years of trying to find some sort of relationship, absolutely nothing, Could, couldn't do it. Um, it does not, measuring any part of the map and trying to calculate what the end result will be does not get you anywhere. With a tangential map, I could run through, I, when I started to look at that, within half a day, I had found a relationship. This is absolutely, a clear, gives a clear relationship between the corneal shape and what lens you're trying to fit. So to summarize that, tangential, shape, tangential maps better represent the corneal shape. They're less sensitive to your patient position to tilt and rotation. So overall, they are superior for contact lens fitting. Actual maps distort the representation of the cornea shape, especially in a regular cornea. Um, but they make the cornea shape visually more dramatic, which is excellent for demonstrating to patients. So my recommendation here is to use your actual map to show the patient they've got a problem, but move to tangential map when you actually want to fit something. OK, so now I'm going to move on to the Medmont software itself, um, going through all the different types of maps and demonstrating how they're different. Um, the, this is generally the same for any machine, even the Pentacam. The principles are the same. I know the Medmont, there's a lot of people who have Medmont in um, Norway, so that's why I'm demonstrating this. We also have Medmont um, in the company as Ultravision. So if you have a Medmont and you want to share information with us, you can export the files and we can have a look. OK. So um, the one thing you, you really need to know about any topography machine is that it's probably unnecessarily complicated. Um, to be honest, you, you have all of this software and you, unless you are a real dedicated instrument person, you probably won't use most of it. So I'm going to run through the mostly important parts. On the MedMob um, and on all machines, you tend to have something you can, you can fill in details about the patient, clinical details and any comments. On this Medmont machine, this is where the corner topography is where you'd actually click uh, to get going. You can um, add and delete patients. Um, and these tabs here allow you to configure and, and view. So in the absence of being able to demonstrate this live, I've got um, a video from the Medmont company to actually show you how you take topography. And with the newer models, you can not only do topography, you can also do tear film analysis, and I'll show you how both of those work. Um, this now, this is composite topography. In order to um, get round the fact you're only uh, measuring the central eight millimeters, you can actually use this to measure straight ahead, up, down, left, and right, and then the software will stitch it all together. Now. I have doubts, I have to say how useful this is, um, as opposed to something like the iSurface Profiler or other similar machines that actually measure the periphery, because after all, it's own, it is based on software stitching together. Um, but whichever way we do it, actually, we do not have a lot of information of how to relate soft lens fitting to 22 millimeters of measurement because we haven't got enough data yet. So here, if I click this video, let's go. So this is how you do it. You click the topography. Now, this is showing a sort of a runway effect because the important thing here 
is for the software to interpret the imaging, the eye has to be exactly the right distance away from the machine. So what you're doing here is moving it backwards and forwards until you hit that middle bar. And then the, the machine does an auto capture. You can check each of these images by zooming in to see what the quality is like. And then you select which one you want and then it captures it. And it's as simple as that. This does this automatically. So you can't actually do anything wrong. If you... If you want to do the tear film analysis, then you pr press that tear film um, um, icon. And when you've got the patient set up into this um, area here, you ask the patient to blink twice to start capturing. And that has to be two obvious blinks. If the patient's just doing slight blinks, it won't work. So let's have a look at how this is wor working. So you line it up in the middle, and when you think you're there, you get the patient blinking, and it starts the video capture of the tear film. Now, this is really useful um, to show how well, how, how dry the eye is. The red areas here is where the tears are breaking up. And what it does is then save these, and you can play them back afterwards. And I find this extremely useful for proving to patients they have dry eyes. Um, and you, what I find is that you can give patients um, drops uh, to lubricate, lubricate the eye, get them back a couple of weeks later, redo this examination and prove to them that what they're doing is working. Um, it's nothing like a patient seeing what they can do themselves. I'm not sure it's that useful in correlating between things like how fast a patient deposits or visual quality, um, because again, I don't think we've got enough information on which to base any kind of, of, of decisions, but certainly to understand how dry an eye is and to explain to a patient, this is invaluable. Okay, so I, what I've, um, I've done here is we've now got um, a capture um, we're showing some astigmatism on, on this. I'm, I will go through again at the end and I'll, I'll explain how all of these are done. But basically, when you, you've, got, uh, you've chosen a map, this comes up here on display and you choose your map from this drop down box here. I'll show you this on the next slide. On the display, you can switch on and off all of these um, annotations here. Again, I'm going to demonstrate that. You have your K readings over here. You have the difference in K readings here. Now, if you choose power, that will give you the corner stigmatism. This index also gives you some idea of corneal irregularity. And generally it's on a traffic light system. So green means um, the, the indices are fine. Amber, you're getting some irregularity, and red shows you have some serious asymmetry. So we can look at that later. So the other important thing to, to note on, uh, on the maps is this area down here, which means you can go between normal, normalized curvature and absolute, and I'm going to explain that as well. Most topography machines also relate a line going across the cornea to changes in radius curvature down here, which gives you an idea of how regular the cornea is. And basically, really, that's all you need on topography is whether what map you're choosing, whether it's normalized or absolute, or whether you put any of these annotations on the map. But this makes a huge difference to transmitting information if you're asking for help on the difficult patients. If you don't know how to set this map up properly, then other people cannot give you the, re the, the required help. OK, so going back up to there on this on the Medmont, if you click that drop down box 
under the display, you have a wide array of choices. And again, on the live demonstration, I'll go through more of these. So you have axial power and tangential power, axial curvature and tangential cornea, the height map, refractive power, elevation, and underneath here, you actually have wavefront distortion. So this, these are all the same eye. This is axial curvature compared to tangential curvature of a central cone. Um, elevation. Now, this is basically um, an adjusted height map. So uh, with regards to a, um, a reference point, which you can actually choose if you want, but you can use the standard one that's, that's in the software. So this shows you and a sort of represents in two dimension what the actual shape is. So you can see you've got a, a small high point in the centre and it drops rapidly away on either side. And I will show you later that this map can often help immensely when you're struggling to understand maps like this. This is the wavefront error map, uh, which won't mean much to you unless you've actually seen a normal eye, which I'll, I will show you again, but you can see it's, it's quite extreme. And then you have power maps, which are more useful to a refractive surgeon than they are to a contact lens fitter. And if you are working in a clinic where you're working with um, surgeons, they will want to supply things in power maps, but really uh, the curvature, radius curve of match are much more important if you're fitting contact lenses. Now we come to absolute and standard power versus normalized. On the Medmont, if you click that down there, it, you can choose it here. You either choose standard, normalized or custom. So what does this actually mean? The absolute or standard sets a constant limit on the highest and lowest point, and it gradates the colors in a very regular way. So it's usually about one, one and a half diopters of power between each step. And this is often how we receive maps from people seeking help. And what you can see from this is that you've got a very sharp red area, a very small transition zone and a lot of blue. And from that lot of blue, you cannot distinguish any radius of curvature whatsoever. So if you send that to us, we will agree with you. Yes, you've got a steep area and a low area, but we can't tell anything else. If you then normalize it, you can see from the scale here that it takes a, as wide a range as it, as it needs to display the whole shape. So it doesn't push everything into one category of, of, uh, of dark blue. It gradates the color across, and it also shows a much wider range of radius of curvature. Now, what you can see here, which you can't see there, is you can see, you can see that actually this area around here is very much the same. You can actually see here, you've got almost like a hill and a valley situation, which is, is very common in nature and is on corners. If you've got a high point, you've also got a corresponding nearby low point, which is very flat. And this, you'll notice, is not visible on the absolute standard map. So when you're looking to understand a cornea, I would always put this into normalized situation. Because otherwise, you're not understanding um, what's going on at all. I would also put on the actual numerical values, and I'll show you how to do that later, because this map um, to be honest, you might as well send that in black and white because that tells us nothing at all about what's going on uh, with this cornea because you don't know anything beyond what's happening in the center. Now, if you look at elevation, this is useful. And, and um, this is a sort of a typical low 
cone. And what you're seeing here is you're seeing the area of which you've got drop off or, or steepers of the corner where it's, it's actually very steep and going back in underneath this point here. You see that actually within the central area, it's fairly even and flat. That can tell you, you could actually get really good vision with the soft lens in this area because it's, um, it's actually equal over a reasonable amount. This a, a steeper area at the top means the corner is actually flattening out a bit. Again, it has to have a sort of a natural shape because it's changing in the middle, but it's anchored by the limbus. So it has to sort of move itself around to actually exist in nature. So that is flattening off at the top. We have a central flat area and then we have a drop off at the bottom. And this can often help to explain why lenses move around or drop a lot. OK, so when we're looking at um, post grafts or post refractive surgery corneas, what is really important to know is if this is the edge of the corneal graft, that's as far as the topography will measure. It's this this particular case is try to pick up something here. Um, it does look like a sort of a tabletop, but it's not very accurate. And we can generally say on a on a corneal graft and a, or an extreme uh, refractive surgery, you will not pick up any useful information around here at all. Sorry. Um, so you're entirely reliant on the central area, which is not very useful in fitting. So again, um, when uh, I talk tomorrow about fitting post graph shapes, I'll give you some advice of how to manage that. So do be aware that the only reliable shape is as far as the edge of the graft on, uh, on a, a post graph shape. When we're going back to these um, annotations here, if you actually click that annotations box on the Megmont, it will bring a call out here uh, of, of the annotations and you can click the ruler and again, I'll demonstrate that later on. And with that, you can measure the HVID of your cornea. The only problem is for most machines, as you get to larger corneas, you start to lose the edge of the cornea altogether. The, I mean, so you, you, but they, by that time, you know you've got a large cornea, but generally you can actually rule across there. The annotations will also bring up the pupil which means that you can see the shape of it, you can see how it moves in, um, under light conditions. And uh, if you leave that on, you can see how it relates to the center of your lens. Now, I'm not going to go into this area because um, th this is a whole different uh, presentation on itself. But if you go onto uh, the analysis tab and click details, you can get everything you want um, about that cornea, including the sag height when you choose a particular cord. This is extremely useful for if you're fitting uh, scleral lenses. And as I said, the, because they, you know, the software for topographers have a mass of information, which you probably never get around to looking at. Um, but for researchers, this is, uh, and people who fit sclerals, this is actually quite useful. Now, differential maps. Um, the, I don't know how often you use a differential map, but they are, they are really um, very, very useful indeed. Um, what you're doing here is you're subtracting, you're, you're taking a, a map you took at one time, say, at, at your first visit. You're then taking a map, say, three months later, a year later. You're subtracting the first map from the later map, and then you're looking at the difference. Now, this is um, a map I took from um, Randy Kojima uh, presentation, um, where he's showing uh, a progression of keratoconus. So this has been, these two have been taken at different times. This was uh, earlier, this is later, and this is the difference map. Now, if the colour is green, it means the corneas are exactly the same. In this case, with red being steeper, 
it shown that it shows that the cone has progressed. You can see it from there, but if you're looking for subtle differences, um, this is very useful. Now, I use this particularly when I've been fitting Kerasoft and I'm looking at um, demolding from uh, RGPs. So here below is one of my patients um, taken on a different, on a Bonai top topography machine. Uh, and I'm afraid that axial maps, they're not tangential because I didn't understand about that back then. Um, this is the original one straight out of the RGP. This was nine months later, and you can see that the cone has literally popped straight out. And this is an important thing to remember for people who fit RGPs. Yes, it does seem to flatten out the cone, but only while you're wearing the lens, exactly like ortho K. If you take the lens away, the cone will come back out. So the carriage cone hasn't disappeared, it's merely masked. So what the difference map does is show you how much the cornea has changed. And on this cornea, almost everything has changed. The superior portion has flattened off. The inferior portion has steepened to the point that the color can't even cope. The color scale can't even cope with it. So unlike this one where you've only got change in one area, this difference map is showing you that the only area that hasn't changed is this line across the middle but the top and the, the inferior the superior and the inferior has changed dramatically so increasingly what different differential maps are used for is for ortho k so this is showing you um, somebody with uh, 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 astigmatism their first visit this is a few days later when they've been wearing the ortho k lens and here they've taken, you, you do this actually in the standard power to give you the biggest uh, obvious change. And this shows you, you have a ring of power change here and the central area, the power has gone down. And from this map, you can actually calculate the change in power of the cornea in ortho K. So again, you take one, you click and hold compare, you click the other one, you go to the view tab and then you bring compare and it brings this one up. Now, the other excellent way to use differential maps is to look at multifocals. Now, what you do with the multifocal is you take a measurement without, just as, as you would normally, without a lens in place. Then you take a measurement with the multifocal being worn. So you're taking it on top of the multifocal. You go to tangential power, put the map in standard, follow the same procedure, and the difference map now shows you the actual power zones of the multifocal lens. Now this is a center distance multifocal that um, is decentered. So the black circle here is the pupil and I've put in white I've sort of tried to mark the zones of the lens so basically this is showing the lens is decentered temporally that the distance portion is towards the edge of the pupil and going right through the middle is the reading portion and this explains entirely why this particular patient could not get on with multifocals and it's important to look at that because if somebody has a particular type of eye shape where lenses often decenter, you will never get a multifocal to work properly at all times because the lens will tend to wander off. And the sooner you know that, the less chair time you will waste trying to sort this problem out. So the differential map is extremely important there. Right now. Heading up for the Kerasoft lecture tomorrow, I'm going to explain how to set up the maps for the base curve calculator. This is the calculator that we have developed, which is actually is very, very simple algorithm. There's nothing miraculous about this. It is to do with averaging central K readings and the steepest and flattest on the five millimeter ring and then averaging those two together. That's all that this calculator is based on, but it works. 
So let me show you how it does that. So you set up the map in tangential. You click the color map, obviously. You click numerical data. You click the polar grid. And again, I've deliberately offset this so you can see the lines here. The lines on the Medmont are very faint. But this is the three millimeter line, the five millimeter and the seven. And the five millimeter is the one you're looking at. So you have it in tangential, you have it normalized to make it easier to see. You put the polar grid on there, you take your SIMK readings, which are already there on the map, and then the steepest and flattest. So here you go around literally picking up where the steepest is, which is around about 7.7, seven, and where the flattest is, oh, it's about 9.2. It's nothing to do with being at right angles to each other. The flattest and steepest could be next to each other, um, but those are the ones you take. And then what you do, you enter the steep and flat K readings, steepest and flattest on the five millimeter ring. And what I've done here is taken a tangential and axial map to show you the difference. So on the time using the tangential readings, you enter the end, you click calculate. There are two uh, correction factors and the correct one is shown in orange. And all you have to do is decide whether the cone is central or low. And then that will give you your first choice lens. Now, look what happens if you do the identical cornea and axial map. You do you put it in the same things. The, the K readings are exactly the same, but the steep and flat are very different, especially the flat. And that will give you a first choice lens of about 7.6. This gives you a first choice lens of 8.6. And on this particular patient, the lens they wear is an 8.6. This would give you a completely wrong um, indication. Now, again, if you are fitting Kerasoft um, in Norway and you want help, and you send a map through to Oleg and Oleg says, OK, I'll, I'll ask Ultravision about this. And you send it to us in Axial and you're just sending the map printout. We still can't do that. We can't. We, we, we use this base curve calculator for all our troubleshooting. That's how we calculate the lenses. If you send an Axial map, we can do it no more than Oleg could do it, no more than you could do it, because you're using the incorrect map. And I can't emphasize that enough. Um, and it really is important to learn how to switch your map from axial to tangential, because then it all becomes very, very easy. So a summary here, tangential, absolutely essential for base curve calculator. Elevation maps help you to understand the coronal shape and the difference maps are very useful for multifocals as well as ortho K. OK, so now I'm going to attempt to get into the software. Um, and this is actually because I'm working from home. This is a standalone software. It's not connected to a topography machine, so I can't demonstrate how that works. Um, so let's show how you actually manipulate things. Now, what I'm just going to do here is take everything off. So without everything, what you get is the reflection of those Placido rings. And you get the differential that in a normal eye, all of these lines are equally spaced. And then from this display, you can start to add things on, like the color map, which yes, you can actually work out what that relates to, but it's so much easier if you do that put the numbers on. You can then put the polar grid on. Now you can see here they are very faint, but that will give you a guidance of your three, five and seven millimeter rings. Ah. Which one are you looking at? You can't see what I'm showing you. Ah, 
Right. Okay. Normally Zoom's good on this. Let me just try. Let me stop. And then try again. Sorry. Is that better now? Right, the last time I did Zoom, this worked automatically. Apologies, because Teams does this as well. Right, okay. Let me go back again. So, there we have um, just the Placido rings, which are evenly spaced. And here you put on the colour map, numeric data, and then the polar grid. Then if you click annotations, it will put on the pupil. And if you look over at this side, you can see pupil width. So let me just pull my down. Um, so here we have K readings, we have millimeters. If we wanted to see what that was in uh, power, we could go to axial power or even tangential power, it won't change. That's 0.35 of diopter. Now, this is really important to look at if you're fitting a keratoconic because, and, and you're trying to get a spectacle refraction. And let's go to something with a little bit more of a keratoconus. Because this will tell you that this particular patient has one, about one and a quarter diopters of sill on the front surface. You can also hear, see straight away that these asymmetric indices have, have started going straight into the red because they're telling you that from one side of the corner to the other, we've got a lot of asymmetry. Now, if you go to something like PMD, you will find that we've got about 10 and a half of astigmatism. Now, this is important because if you're starting and trying to look for spectacle refraction, that is going to be reasonably close unless the posterior cornea is badly distorted. This is where I always start on my refraction. I go straight to this point here. I say I've got about 10 and a half. The axis is somewhere around about 80 because it, it's really difficult to tell on, on, on any keratoconic. And that's where I start with my spectacle refraction at that point. It's interesting sometimes that when people are, are troubleshooting and they send maps through, that we've got about 10 diopters here and the spectacle refraction is only three diopters. And then people are struggling to get an over refraction. That's because you really do have to pay attention to this. It may not work if the, if the back surface is um, equally distorted, you may find that's not exactly 10 and a half diopters, but I would say in about 70 to 80% of the cases, you will find uh, that is the case, unless they've been surgically altered or have intacts. So if we then, let's just take that down to standard power or actual curvature even. This is the typical shape you get um, for PMD or very low cone. It's even got names like crab claw or ballerina or birds kissing because it's so very distinctive. But again, this is not really um, explaining what the corneal shape is like. We don't really have big dips here um, and these, this sort of distorted shape. If you look at the tangential, this now represents a more normal shape. So let me just go between those two, axial and tangential. This really shows here that around all of these areas, this is quite symmetrical. We've got 10, 7, 10, 9, 9, 5, 9, 7, 8, 9, 8, 9. This is something you can fit with a contact lens. The only thing that's really a problem is this area down here. And if you look at the elevation, that's even more impressive. That's telling you actually you've got a big area of normal looking cornea 
And what you're really worried about is how the lens is going to fit over this sharply changing curvature at the bottom. So this explains actually why soft lenses work so well in many cases, because you do actually have a lot more normal cornea available than the um, axial map would tell you. Because from this map, what it's saying is in the pupil area, we've got massive changes of curvature going on all the way around. What this elevation map is telling you is that's all essentially flat and normal. So this is why it's really important on any map you've got to go to this drop box, go all the way through and check what it's doing. Now, let me just go back to a normal cornea and we will look at wafer error. Now, this is sort of calculating the optics, if you like, as much as they can uh, through an eye. It's not extremely useful because it doesn't take into account the back surface of the cornea or the, the front and back surface of the lens. But it's telling you the optical quality of the front surface. And that's generally what um, a normal eye looks like within the pupil area. You've got basically uh, an even wavefront. But if we go back um, to keratoconic, this is what you're suddenly faced with. And you can see that halfway through the pupil, you get a massive distortion. And this is why keratoconics see shadowing and ghosting because in the middle of their pupil, they've got massive changes in power function. And this is explains why they have this issue. But if we go to the PMD, again, we find it's a little bit different. Right in the middle, it's not that bad. It only starts to go off down at this area. And quite often, if you can get a lens on there, which says 200 microns thick, which is typical of a soft lens, that will smooth that out enough for the patient to see. All of this, you're not really worried about because the patient isn't seeing through it. So again, the wavefront error, although it's not terribly useful, does give you some idea of what's going on. Now, um, out of interest, Let's just show you what this tear film quality is like. This is a normal eye. And this is showing you, you have some areas of, of breaking up, but by and large, this is a healthy um, tear film. The patient's keeping their eye open for as long as possible. As time goes by, it starts to break up. Now, if you're looking at a bad example, You see here, we're starting to get breakup. And before keeping the eye open before long, it's all gone quite, quite bad. And that can, if you can go from that to the healthy one using drops, you can prove to your patient you're actually doing something well. This is why this is extremely useful. Um, again, um, this is interesting. This is the uh, a normal astigmatism with the wavefront error, which with a regular astigmatism, you've still got areas of good vision in the middle. And again, what I was going to show you on this is the difference between axial um, curvature here, which uh, and then tangential. Just by clicking that, you can see the difference. And it's as easy as that. Also, if actually while I'm just thinking about it, for anybody who wants to know how to export, if you it's, click that small area up here, um, sorry, file, and you export, you can then export that, you can rename it, export it, and send it through to Oleg or, or myself. And when we've got this, we load this up into here, and we can then go through all of these. And we can go through all of this. This is how the difference is on standard and normalized. 
and then we can get an idea of what's going on with this cornea. Um, I think, oh, I think, yes, the, just to explain, this is the only one I've got a lot of measurements for. If you're, this is a patient of mine who has, who has graphs that tend to move around a lot. Um, and if you're doing a differential, if I take one in November 2012, for example, uh, right eye, and I do that in October 2013, so roughly a year apart. Now, what I did there was control click, and they come up side by side. So you can actually compare the two together. You then go to view and then compare. Now, unless you actually know how to do that, it takes you a while to work that out. Um, it is in the manual, but it takes a, it, it, you, know, you really have to practice yourself to do that. So here we have a year apart on a grafted patient, the difference between the two. And you can see in that year, this area stayed very much the same. The central area has flattened. And this, this graft is, is now 30 years old. And we can get these changes going on within the space of three months. And this is why um, I've, I've been monitoring this patient all the way all from 2011 all the way to now, because it's fascinating to see how this changes. Um, but it's also important for the patient to understand how soon or if these, these graphs are going to reject, because he's living on borrowed time with these graphs. Well, this is how you tell the difference. Now, that's about as much as I, I want to say there. While I've got the software up, does anybody want to ask any questions? For contact lens fitting, there's no good point for the actual map. The actual map is good for demonstrating and it's good for normal corneas, spherical corneas. Um, and it's the map, the actual power map uh, or refractive map is what refractive surgeons use for, for refractive surgery. But they are essentially, um, for normal refractive surgery, working on normal corneas. Um, for me uh, and for many people, and if you listen to um, Randy Kojima over at Pacific University, we all now are using the tangential map, but it's a case of having to change concepts. The actual map was, was popular probably 30, 40 years ago, but it's like anything, it takes a long time to get beyond that. And this is what this lecture is all about, to show you what the tangential map can be used for. Um, and again, when we're discussing it with Medmont um, themselves, they, they, they understand that, but they still send them out default to the axial. Um, I would say, I mean, if you've got a keratoconic like that, the actual curvature can show the patient there's something really wrong with their eye compared to that. Well, actually, let's do it normal, standardised. That looks very normal and that's good to show a patient. You've got a normal eye, it's all green, it's great. If you go to something else, that looks really abnormal. So the axial is really good at showing abnormalities. Um, but when you want to do anything useful, then tangential and normalized is much more useful. For example, um, let me see if I can find this. Yes, this was a patient I saw actually um, when I was locuming in Leighton Buzzard. Here, I was just doing a locum to help out a local practice. And a young girl came in and she was having saying she was about 16 she was having a little bit of trouble with her vision and when I actually did this I I actually brought her into a latent buzzard to actually do topography because they didn't have one and the actual map immediately shows she's got a problem now actually the numbers are not that bad um, but if you do wavefront on that you can see it's quite abnormal but in tangential, it doesn't look anywhere near as bad, especially if you do it in um, normalised. 
but the left eye wasn't as bad, but in axial, it starts to look bad as well. So absolutely, for, for seeing if you've got an immediate problem, is useful because it assumes this is your middle of the of your highest point of the cornea. So it distorts anything on either side. So that's the use of the action map is showing something up. It is, and I think I, the sagittal comes from the fact it's looking at the sagittal height along the axis in the middle of the cornea. So that's why it's called sagittal. So you've got sagittal axial are the same, tangential instantaneous is the same. Absolutely. Um, you should, the machine usually will prompt you to calibrate um, and you should keep them calibrated because if, so some of them like um, the Keraton Scout actually theoretically needed calibrating after every single reading, which nobody ever did, which meant after about six months to a year, you are getting some very odd readings from the, the machine. So most machines need calibrating around about yearly, uh, depending on, on usage. If you use it a lot, I'll calibrate it every six months. That's all for today. What I'm going to do tomorrow um, is I'm going to look at Kerasoft. I'm going to go through the fitting fairly quickly. And as you suggested, Oleg, I've got about six cases at the end where I go from easy and then go to complicated maps and trying to understand what the map is telling us how to fit. OK, which is why I think it's good getting the topography out of the way so we're not struggling to interpret maps while we're looking at carousel fitting. Okay.